Well, hello, and welcome back to the Better Call Saul Insider Podcast. This is episode 605, Black and Blue. Black and Blue. All right. It was uh, written by Allison Tatlock. It was directed by Melissa Bernstein. And I'm Chris McCaleb. I am an editor on Better Call Saul. And uh, with us, as always, is our co-host, also uh, former editor, Better Call Saul, Breaking Bad, and uh, the best editor that I've ever met, Kelly Dixon. Aww. Wow. Yay. Wow. Thanks, Yay. Chris. <laughs> That's all true. Wow, How's thanks, it going, Chris. Cal? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm great. We're we're just uh, we're we had an action packed weekend. We've been working all weekend. Full disclosure. So maybe we're going to be a little loopy. Who knows? We don't know what's <laughs> going to happen. I know who else is loopy. It's our co-pilot, uh, assistant editor, and editor on Better Call Saul, Joey Reinish. Hello. Hey. Hey. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you, Joey. I'm actually in full disclosure. Joey and I are in the same room, and it's really exciting. It's nice to just be around people. <laughs> And, uh, and all these board games. It's a crazy situation in here. Intelligent books, you mean. Um, the intelligent books, yeah. We're super smart with our books in our backgrounds. Um, so we got a lot to talk about this episode. Um, so let's, I mean, just let's get into it. We got our the co-creators and executive producers of this show, Vince Gilligan and Peter Gould. Yay! Yay, Yay us! Yay them! Hello, hello. <laughs> Uh, hello. And our very special guest this week, the, the you've already heard their names. You've probably already heard their voices. Uh, we have the writer of this episode, Allison Tatlock, and the director of the episode, Melissa Bernstein. Yay! Yay! Oh, wow. And what an episode. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is an awesome episode. We go by Burnlock. Ooh. <laughs> or, or Tatstein, depending on the... Tatstein's good, too. Burn, Burnlock definitely sounds like a show. Like, that's a show, like, you know, this sounds week on Burnlock. a little more badass. Yeah. Actually, it'd be a good law firm, Burnlock Tatstein. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of our options. Well, if, we had done, if we're going another season, that's what yeah. we should do. Or depending on how this goes, a future career. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of upset that the whole like two fabulous ladies making a fabulous episode title didn't get pitched like on on the last episode. Oh, that's yeah. right. Six oh four. Yeah. That, that what was about my us? Pitch, but nobody listens to me any longer. So. <laughs> what? Well, what about Allison and I? We're also two ladies who you know gave it their all. Just keep that in mind. That's true. Good point. Mm-hmm. Well, hey, you know what? This episode had the return of Lalo. He's back, everybody. Yay. We've been missing Lalo for the last few weeks. And, and Nothing re- like a Lalo. Yeah, but, but here's the thing. It's like we always knew that Lalo was alive. Um, it's just the characters didn't know that Lalo was alive, which I think is actually really, really cool dramatically. I like the way, and I know nothing on these episodes for the, I think, third time, um, third season. And what I like is how you guys are playing with what the audience knows versus what the characters know. I like sometimes being ahead, sometimes being behind. It's a really nice, um, it's, a, it's a really nice dynamic. Do you guys talk about that, that at all in the writer's room? I'm sure you do. I'm, I'm sure that that is a rhetorical question. I'm curious how Typically, that plays out. Typically, we don't out. talk about much. We just sort of type buttons on the keyboard and then, <laughs> believe you. And then the, the, when the assistant tells us if we got something or not. Nah, we don't believe you. <laughs> I remember a lot of jokes. What are, what are, what's, is there a memorable joke that you can share with us with for the podcast audience? Definitely not. But I do want to say, <laughs> just in a suck up way, that um, I'm delighted to be here with the legend, Kelly. Yay. Aww. We did not overlap on the show, but when I came in, all I heard, Kelly, Kelly, Kelly. That's now, here we are. That's, oh, that, that's nice. Thanks. But seriously, but, do you guys ser- ever talk about that? The serious answer to Kelly's question has got to be, we. I do remember us talking a lot about, is it? Is it is this a good thing or a bad thing that Lalo's not anywhere in sight? You know, and I think the yes. consensus was, uh, you know, uh, people when they want to see somebody show back up and you're not giving it to them, they can get kind of frustrated with you. But that's a good thing, not a bad thing. I mean, it's yeah. good that he's not around for a while, right? Yeah, because, I mean, well, the one thing that, you know, is is kind of going from the last episode that we saw is, you know, Kim is tipped off that Lalo is alive, but she does not tell Jimmy. And the way this this uh, episode opens, especially in Act One, not the teaser, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but Kim is stressed because you know she's laying in bed, she gets up, she knows that Lalo is alive. She is specifically not telling Jimmy. I mean, that's that's the one thing I took away from those uh, first few scenes. And so I was just curious, 
Like, I know that you guys, I've been talking to you guys about the writer's room since season two of Breaking Bad. So I know that you guys are always talking about, well, we're curious about in whose head are we and we're Walt's head. And I know that as an editor, I'm constantly thinking about, yes, those guys' heads, but where's the audience head as well? So I'm wondering if that happens. I think, I feel like we talked about, we talked about it a lot. I, I agree with what Vince is saying. We, I, there was a, almost an ongoing discussion with involving more than one character throughout the season about delayed gratification and kind of finding the sweet spot. Like you want viewers to be hungry, but not so hungry. They get a headache, you know? So it's like when, when, (laughs) what is the right amount of hunger? What is the right amount of desire and irritation? How irritated can they be with us that will then be satisfying instead of just annoying? So we felt like this was the right amount of delay. What and Kelly specifically? You thinking? Are you wondering? Are you asking yourself how come she didn't tell her partner? How come she didn't tell? Uh, no, uh, I, I wasn't wondering that at all. Oh. I was just wondering, just from the perspective of you guys planning out your story and you know, I guess uh, breaking the the whole thing. It's like you're gonna have this entity of Lalo that our characters are not going to know anything about, but we as an audience absolutely know that he's still out there. I mean, it, height, it keeps the drama high. We know at some some point the two are going to come back together. So I was just wondering how you guys manage yeah. that. This is my understanding of the much debated Tom's Law. Uh, this, this goes to that because... <laughs> can you it, repeat Tom, Tom's Law too? Yeah. I, 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 I can't, but I can tell you what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you what it's about. Which is that you don't want to have your characters running around desperately uh, trying to trying to find some piece of information that the audience has had for a long, long time. Yes. Uh, and it's and so it's a very I think it's one of the reasons why it felt right to have Gus figure it out pretty quickly. Uh, and, 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 and so that Gus Gus absolutely knows that Lalo's alive. He's just he's that smart. Uh, but it's anyway, that's that's this. I don't know. Could. Vince, do you have? Can you synopsize Tom's law? Tom's this, law, I, the way I always see it in my head, and tell me if I'm wrong. You could have, you could write the character of Albert Einstein, the smartest person in the world, into your screenplay, and if Einstein doesn't know something, you know, like he doesn't yet know E equals M C squared, and the audience does, the audience on some level is going to think he's a fucking idiot. That's that's right. There that's, you go. That's the way I synopsize well Tom's said. law. Well said. So. It's not even fair necessarily, but it's 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 tricky. And by the way, that's a legitimate tool in the toolbox as a storyteller. You got to be able to have the audience is sometimes has to be ahead of the uh, main character. So and so there's nothing wrong with that. And Tom's law doesn't automatically kick in. Tom's law, by the way, it, it, did we say Tom Schnauz? Right? I was, about, I was we, gonna say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Named okay. after the Tom Schnauz. So Tom Schnauz gave the world. Tom's Law, the writing world, and he also gave the world squatting naked over mirrors. So he's got those two things going for him. He's very but, accomplished. Uh, yes, he is. And Schnauz but, Cheese. <laughs> Schnauz Farms, yeah. Schnauz Farms Cheese. That's right. Delicious. It's the best. That's a, that's a deep tease for a later episode. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's it. It's an Easter egg. It's a priester egg, as we, as we coined them in the uh, 601 podcast. Clever. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's 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 nonstop cleverity here. Is cleverity a word? <laughs> it is. Should be. <laughs> Se- severely clever. I feel like. Yeah. No. I like so, it. So, do you guys want to chat a little bit about what the meaning of or why you chose to do your teaser as this? I'm assuming it's some sort of award. The slide the, roll. Yeah, the gift that the, has the, been the encased. Gift. Beautifully yeah. shot teaser, by the way. Talk about the shooting of that. So, and Melissa, what was it like doing? This is your second episode. This is, uh, and you did just knocked it out of the park. What's it like? What's it? What was that like? And then, and yeah, I want to know about that teaser too. How long did it take to shoot that, and where did you shoot it? Well, uh, it your second episode with Allison Tatlock. Twice the fun. Uh, love that. Yes. Um, the, we shot the teaser actually at the same time as we were shooting the boxing scene. So, um, you know, we were in a space. Yeah. We had, you know, three cameras that day. Um, and Matt Cradle is, was actually the DP of the teaser. So, you know, he had one set up in one portion of the space and then Marshall and like, and the stunt 
gang and, you know, had our whole boxing uh, situation all set up in another portion of the space. So it was a very uh, busy day. Damn, Were you on roller been... skates going back and forth uh, between your right. two sets? She yeah. was. It was incredible. Jesus. Uh, we had monitors set up, so it was, and it, you know, and and Louis Lonnie was with Matt, so it was. I think the communication was flowing. That actually, it wasn't so bad. That wow, part of it. it was I had really no cool because yeah. we would, as soon as we had a break from boxing, we would, with great excitement, check in on what was happening over in Lucite Land, and it was two <laughs> very different juxtaposed worlds and uh pretty cool actually to to go back and forth i had no idea that's really tough and and so whose hands are those is that someone who's really an expert at making these things that is yes um yeah we were really lucky um to have a expert come from the mark hansen world um it was uh like a really incredible uh like he he knew exactly what he was doing which was great um his name's ryan and he was able to guide us uh on like the right practice and um and then do and then actually do all of the like do the process sort of in bits and pieces and you know we we re, we looked at the real process and then you know uh, focused in on very specific bits uh, and tried to make it as real and as aesthetically pleasing for camera as possible. Obviously, but Ryan was always there guiding us about you know what what would be legitimate. I I love that teaser and I love how uh, is is that what you reacted to Kelly the idea that it's uh, that it that it's it's this weird teaser. I mean, it's beautiful, but just, and, and it's not weird, but it's just, what, what's going on? And then at the very end of the whole episode, oh my yeah. God, that's how, that's how. Well, that's, that's know. what I was curious about when you guys were uh, breaking that part of it. What was the purpose of it? I mean, just to sort of initiate us into possibly Germany or, I mean, what was, what was the thought behind it? I know, you, I mean, I know you guys work really hard. In the writers' room and stuff like that, so I was just curious about the discussion. So it's it's so we're seeing um, Werner Ziegler's slide rule get encased in you know in uh, lucite lucite acrylic acrylic, <laughs> acrylic yeah, or acrylic. lucite. I think yeah. the two words are I think are interchangeable, but don't, don't, don't tell me if I'm wrong. Somebody out there. Yeah. So the slide rule, which is like this sort of old fashioned tool that Werner used in his practice and like what made him Werner, like it was, you know, part of his whole uh, toolkit as um, the builder and designer and architect of the super lab. And we're watching this like this sentimental element get encased in lucite or or acrylic and um and ultimately that becomes a gift to werner's wife and um ultimately later in the episode lalo sees this slide rule in you know that has been made into this monument and when he turns it over he sees you know where it was made and that gives him enough of a lead to know where to go next because he's on this search for proof and as you pointed out at the beginning of the episode, like we all know that Lalo's alive and we know he's on a search for proof, but we don't know where he is or how he's hoping to ascertain that proof. So that's sort of, I think, the excitement of like catching up with what he's up to. And it felt fun to start with a mystery that would then be answered at the end of the episode. Like we're, he's, he's a missing man right now, as we talked about a minute ago. And the teaser felt like it could literally be a tease of like, we don't know what this thing is or why it's important. Why are we seeing German writing now? And then to blow everybody's minds by having him not just show up at the end, but in another country. And that that would uh, story-wise link to this object. I feel like there was a lot of discussion around that. And also the teasers themselves, I I feel are so fun to... um, I don't know, to, to kind of craft in the writer's room. And we felt, Peter Vince, tell me if, if you think this is right, that it was time uh, to in, to offer and enjoy one of what we call like a super stylized sort of macro process oriented. We would never do those one after the other after the other, but it felt like a good moment to uh, to mix it up. I, I, I like the way you put that. It, it, I like, you know, in both shows, there's a lot of investment in uh, 
in objects and, and you know and there's the idea of a little thing a seemingly little thing can can turn into a big thing it's yeah something about sometimes it's just fun I, what do you think peter sometimes it's just fun to slow down for stuff like that so that the audience you know we always say mystery mystery's good confusion's bad but mystery's good mm-hmm. and that's a very mm-hmm. mysterious teaser and uh, and i love that our audience gives us a breathing room to uh to with moments like that to you know to, they say to themselves i would hope they say well, i don't know what this means yet but i am confident they're going to let us know what it means eventually and and i think it was also fun because we got to play with the idea of oh are we in a lab setting is somebody making meth like what are they making what's happening here we got to do a little bit of a i think uh revisit to our breaking bad lab world and also right now, four of the first five episodes of this season have teasers that do not feature any of our characters, <laughs> our lead characters. <laughs> well, that's true. interesting. That is, that is interesting. We didn't plan for that, did we? It wasn't, it wasn't like a union rule or we, <laughs> could, we couldn't use them you know, that much or whatever. We did, how did it work that way? I can't even remember now. What do you think, Peter? That's, it's a great question. Uh, you know, we're fa- I, the physical world of the show is just fascinating. So, I mean, I, I don't know that we thought of it that particular way but it's a uh, uh of course you know, oh shit no sorry never mind cut this out I'm gonna, <laughs> never mind <laughs> i'm i'm a little punchy yeah uh, as chris <laughs> said chris said we were working yesterday so maybe you just skip over me for a bit <laughs> uh, M- melissa how how was the experience of of directing the second time out uh versus the first time um i think like to me it was a little uh, a little calmer, a little like more relaxed. I don't love the, um, you know, baby's first steps, hot, like spotlight on my activities that, <laughs> that happened on the first episode. <laughs> I mean, with lots of love, but like, I just, that like <laughs> extra focus on me doesn't put me at ease. So this was much better because it was just like, oh, this is what we, do. you know, there was no like first time you know, like doing this first time doing that. It just felt more relaxed and more fun. Um, so I appreciated that. Um, I mean, it is, you know, I, I know you guys hear this every episode, but it's the best crew and the best cast and just, it's an incredible team. And, um, I think really as the director, you're just, you're just hearing amazing, smart, thoughtful ideas from every department and every department head and every sector of the show. And, you just get to kind of pick between those great ideas um, to string together an episode. So it's a privilege to be in that seat for sure. And also, Melissa, you have a, some special advantages because you probably spent more time on the set of the show than any other director. Uh, yeah. you know, and, and also spent so much time with every every single department and our beloved by every single department and the cast. So that's you start off with... Uh, uh, was a lot of, there's a lot of goodwill right there from the beginning and, and it's well earned, well earned and a, and a deep understanding of how the whole thing goes together, uh, which is, you know, that's a, there's, there's no, there's no, there's no way to get, there's no way to, uh, to, you know, to get, to get that except for the way that you've done it. Well, yeah, I, I mean, it is, it is nice. I think, uh, everybody cuts me a lot of slack cause I've showed up for the last <laughs> 15 years or whatever it is. Yeah. So. That does help. Did you discover uh, hot dogs on this on this particular go around as a director, or what I call director pills? <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> hot dogs don't do it for me. Uh, I'm more of a iced coffee gal um, and sugar. Okay, <laughs> and sugar. Yeah, All right. Melissa <laughs> and I have different dietary needs. We do. Wait, so what, <laughs> what's different. your what's your thing on the set, Allison? I I, I enjoy a healthy. And she doesn't. She and her home her, nuts. She brings nuts from home in oh, little bags. So I don't think we should talk about home nuts in this context. <laughs> that is private. <laughs> well, and also my pocket yogurt. Don't mention it. <laughs> how about how about can we talk about Francesca's bag? Yes. Yay. Yay. Francesca, Tina Parker. Tina yeah. Parker's the best. Yeah. Oh, what a dream to work with, and uh, and what a, one of our favorite character. I mean, one of my favorite characters, and I think one the show just adores collectively. Speaking of nuts, and this is going to sound like I'm trying to make a joke. She gave me a bag of special spicy pecans that are made in her hometown there in Dallas, Texas. They are so good. I'm going to find some more of them on the internet. They're like this big bag of, and they're really got a kick to them. 
Really? I can't. I, I, I should. I cannot remember the name of the the good folks who make them. Those uh, are your home nuts now. They're spicy. Those are my home nuts. Spicy yeah. home nuts. <laughs> yes, and they are delicious. Vince anyway, Gilligan's sorry. spicy home nuts. Yes, I got exactly. a, I got a question. I mean, getting into Francesca eventually, but I'm curious because I don't think we. I never really talked to you guys from the Breaking Bad podcast, and even like in the first couple of years of Saul. But I feel like this is a good time to talk about it. So the place where Saul's office is, obviously, we used way back in the day and now are using it again. I'm curious, what was, is that place? How did you get it originally? And how did you get it again? Is there a story there? Oh, Jesus, we'll probably do a whole, a whole podcast about yeah. this. <laughs> Mullah? Melissa, what? <laughs> well, it's an it's an you know an office space in a strip mall, um, yeah. in what is that North East Heights kind of? I think it's is it Northeast or yeah Northeast Northeast Heights. That's right. Yeah, and yeah. It, the strip mall itself has had different tenants over time, different anchor tenants over time. Some of the same. Um, but you know, we were able to get back there, I mean, to the same place and that store was empty when we found it this time around, which was convenient. (laughs) Um, there have been changes over time, uh, you know, each of which we looked at to assess what we needed to change and adjust. Um, but you know, we're part of I think telling the story of how Jimmy becomes Saul is giving him his accoutrement, his office, yeah. his his caddy, you know, his uh his pinky ring and his uh and his uh uh Bluetooth. The Bluetooth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So all of his the things that make that character that character and we've been doing them over time. Um and this was the moment for the office and getting uh Francesca into that installed in that office. And I remember not it wasn't on the podcast, Melissa, but uh when Ray and I were talking about uh six oh four, she mentioned that you guys had had early conversations about how each of you was gonna shoot that toilet in there <laughs> and like, you know, it's sort of like like having different ideas and like, I want to do that. And so you guys kind of worked in tandem to make sure that there was no uh, repeating of, of toilet yeah. ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Can I tell, I'm going to, I'm going to take some rare, uh, I'm going to take, I'm going to take some credit for something and say it was completely my idea. Uh, one thing I, I've never done this in this show. Can I tell you where the toilet came from? <laughs> oh yes, should. please. Everyone should hear this. <laughs> so uh, the toilet was my idea. Uh, and I remember that distinctly. Uh, and uh, that was because uh, none of the other good stuff in this episode was made, just the toilet. <laughs> but uh, the toilet was my, my friend Ken and I, 30 years ago, were in Richmond, Virginia. And I was hanging, I was hanging out with my friend Ken. He was looking for a new uh, apartment. And we're, you know, so I'm hanging out with him. Oh, yeah, I'll look at this place. I'll look at this place. And, these, and we're looking around the VCU area, Virginia Commonwealth University, and the, and the landlord... Uh, who's showing him around. We go into this one apartment, the guy opens the door, and it's this nice looking, you know, fan, the the fan, Richmond area uh, neighborhood called the fan. This nice fan apartment, except it's got a toilet right in the middle of the living room. And it's unplumbed. They had pulled it out and left it there, and someone has used it as if it were plumbed. Oh, no. <laughs> and I'm not talking number one. Oh, no. And... The brilliant, the brilliance of it was this landlord, or it was a realtor, I don't know what, walks around and says, hardwood floors, <laughs> floor to ceiling window. You don't get this anymore. You've got the press tin ceiling. Now that is a classic. He literally <laughs> <laughs> walks around the toilet <laughs> and without mentioning it. And it, smel- and it smells? I'm sure it, it did. was everything yeah, you can too. imagine, <laughs> <laughs> and more, and more. And he's walking around. He says, "Wow, this hearth, this is classic." <laughs> and I finally say, "Dude," and he says, uh, "I'm sorry, yes, dude. What's with the fucking toilet?" <laughs> <laughs> and he looks at it like he had just seen it for the first time. He's like, "Oh, well, uh, that we'll fix that." <laughs> <laughs> was there a lid on the toilet? <laughs> no. That's no. A good question. Did your no. did your friend take the apartment? 
Of course. Oh, no, no, he, Free he, toilet. He, he did not. He, he did not. He didn't take it. Oh, okay. he, just so long as the toilet stayed, he was happy. Yes, no, he, no, he, he, no, he did not. That was pretty hilarious. Anyway, what is the history of of, of that of of getting that? But to Kelly's question of of finding that place before it was it was it was helpful to us that it was empty. I, I would thank uh, Melissa and Allison because it didn't have to clear it out or whatever. But. Before it was empty, it was a fun uh, Western saloon, wasn't it? And it had a mechanical bull in it. So I think that's one of the answers Whoa. to your questions. Yeah, I think so. And, and in fact, what you see in there, that empty that empty space, that was, uh, I believe, most of those walls are actually put in by our art department. And they also dressed the, the way, the, the, the raw way those walls look and the way the floor looks. That's all... That's all our art department because, in fact, it was part of a much larger space when it was this saloon. Uh, so, you know, and once again, uh, Denise Pizzini and our, our incredible art department uh, took us back in time. The other thing to mention, I don't even know if this is worth mentioning, but for various logistical reasons uh, that I, Melissa can go into, I won't, uh, we ended up sh- having to shoot all the exteriors of uh, that that entire location. We had to shoot that whole location out in a very brief amount of time. So you'll see, uh, it's this is such a strange season that way because yeah. you'll see scenes in many different episodes that were shot the same week or even the same day at that location. Isn't, isn't, that, isn't that right, Melissa? That's how I remember it. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, we shot this uh, day ahead of time, it, like in the middle of four, I think. And then, yeah, and... Uh, and Maybe a future episode. Uh, oh, well, could, could it, it was a producer's nightmare, was it not? And add to that, when it was a saloon, they put an outdoor patio that was a concrete riser about eight inches tall, six inches tall, the same, however tall the curb is. It was this big outdoor patio. And we had, we, uh, God bless our construction department and God bless our, our producers. And that's uh, starting with Melissa Bernstein. It, it, we we said well this was never here before on any of these other episodes of uh, of Breaking Bad or or you know anything how do we deal with this do we digitally erase it do we shoot around it and goddamned if uh, the the crew didn't jackhammer I don't know if it was the crew or a separate contractor but jackhammered the whole thing up got rid of it you wouldn't even know it was ever there amazing yeah I, I Jim Powers and uh Christian our locations manager they yes. did a lot of negotiating to to make all of that work and yeah, yeah it, there were yeah th- that the patio was something we couldn't we couldn't quite embrace um right. given what the future holds in our storyline and it was huge it was like 20 by 30 feet or I, I, I was I don't know it was big it was yeah. like a, it used to have a whole bunch of outdoor tables on it and amazing and it was uh, suddenly poof it's gone like it was never there well, and that lo- that location is right around the corner from uh, Marble Brewery. If you're a beer fan and you're in Albuquerque, that's something that Joey Lou turned me on to. Joey Lou spent a lot of time in Albuquerque, and uh, it's a really good beers at, at Marble. Amazing. I'm curious. Um, this is sort of like it just kind of came to me because you guys are shooting locations that are known from Breaking Bad, and because. We know that people go to Albuquerque to see locations for Breaking Bad. Were you ever dealing, like, not at this location, but have you been dealing at all with fans who, like, show up and you guys actually, like, are there shooting a location? Have you guys had to deal with that at all? Yeah, funny story about that, uh, Kel. Uh, when we were shooting the movie El Camino, a good example of that was uh, we did a scout with the crew uh, of the Twisters uh, restaurant, the, the 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 location known uh, for uh, you know no, lo- known as uh, Los Pollos Hermanos, and we were there and looking around inside, and all of a sudden one of our folks came up and said, "The Breaking Bad tour is here. <laughs> the the bounder has just showed up. Uh, the 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 Winnebago, you know, with the with the local tour, and we all we were luckily we we're just about done anyway. We all ran out the back." And jumped in our bus and and, <laughs> and and the reason was not not because we don't want to say hi to the fans or anything. It was because at that point El Camino was a big, big, big secret. The movie was a big, big secret, and we so that that kind of stuff happens. But you know, good good a time as any to sing the praises of of Christian Diaz de Bedoya, our, our wonderful location manager. He and his folks who work in his department are the re are one of the biggest reasons. 
uh, other than the crew in general just being wonderful. One of the biggest reasons that we have been able to go over the years and over the different shows and the movie back to these locations because there's a, there's a term called burning a location. It's when a, a lesser crew, you know, not to name any names, uh, uh, is, is, is uh, using a location, using someone's house or whatever, leaves it a mess, doesn't clean it up right, is nasty to the homeowners, is, is indifferent to the homeowners and their needs. Christian is the, he's the best, he's like the best, and I've worked with a lot of good location managers. He's the best I've ever worked with, but he leaves everybody happy. He leaves everybody happier than they were when he met them. And it is a credit to him, first and foremost, that we're able to go back to these locations for 15 years straight and not have people hold us up for money. We, we pay well to begin with, and, and, and we treat folks right, and they have reciprocated with kindness and hospitality. And, and I, I just want to want to give give credit to Christian for that, you know. And we all try to be good uh, guests when we're, when we're in someone's house, but it all really starts with Christian. I just keep thinking about that Breaking Bad tour, and if they had pulled up and like, and here's the Twisters, it's really a poya, and Vince Gilligan and Aaron Paul are here. <laughs> <laughs> they would have been very excited. It was... It <laughs> Best <been>. tour ever. <laughs> it would have been fun to say hi, but it just... We just and, and we were not shooting yet. We were this was an advanced scout, right. but it was it was funny. We all kind of ran out the back, <laughs> like pushing each other out the door. Get out of here! <laughs> That's good. So, um, God, there's a sh- shit ton to talk about, and we're gonna. I just don't want to run out of time because I know that there's so many things that, um, like you know, fans watching the show are gonna wonder about. Um, I I wanted to like ask you just right quickly though about. The boxing, Melissa, and um, training the guys, you know, the choreography of the boxing and how much, how much like prep went into all of that? Uh, quite a bit of prep. Um, I, Is it, either it, one of those guys like a fighter? Is either one? Um, no, neither. I mean, neither of them are boxers specifically, but um, Bob's in incredible shape and had undergone a lot of training for nobody and a lot of, you know, so he's very coordinated and certainly had been in a similar position in terms of, uh, you know, knowing how to move his body in a like dangerous way. (laughs) Um, and, uh, and Patrick is, he's very fit. He's all, he's not a boxer either, but you know, very athletic. So obviously that helped a lot. Um, But, you know, we had Al Goto, our, you know, amazing stunt coordinator. And then this episode, we are able to bring Luis Moncada, um, who plays one of our cousins, uh, behind uh, the camera. And he was one of, he was our fight coordinator and he was incredible. Um, And Luis has taught some of us um, boxing lessons in uh in real life me one of them and and he's incredible with movement um he's an incredible coach and uh it was just such a natural fit to bring him on board to help and i think i think bob and patrick really really enjoyed that uh process and we started by i think coming up between you know peter and allison and I, and i and the rest of the team like kind of an arc for the fight like what was happening story-wise between these characters in the sections and then like and then I brought that to Al and then Al you know put it to video and had some ideas that he added and then Luis had some ideas that he added and then uh and then Allison and I worked with them in person we went to a gym to watch them practice um, and we just kind of kept refining it. We had, uh, there were stunt doubles, fight doubles for both Patrick and Bob too. Um, so it was a real team effort, obviously, and with the camera department um, as well. Uh, just, How did you do the shot between the gloves? Like the very first one where it's just the gloves that you see? Yeah, it was a really unusual camera mount that um, Marshall Adams came up with. Because uh, it's tricky. Usually those can throw you off because... The height yeah, they don't look like a right. GoPro weird kind yeah. of weirdness. Yeah. Yes, that was all Marshall's um, brilliance in engineering. Really great shots in that. I, that's that. That was the what I wrote down in my notes. Just, I love that the like the POV shot and 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 uh, it was just really kinetic and really. 
I don't know. I I felt like we were really in that fight, yeah. and we're seeing a very you're this whole episode. We're seeing a, a different side of Howard Hamlin. I mean, we're. I mean, you know, I guess you normally say the gloves are off, but the the gloves are on, and uh, I've I I I, don't, I I love seeing this side of him. I, I love uh, yeah. what talk about uh, working with him on on this was was. Uh, how how was the process of you know sort of bringing him to that place? Uh, Patrick, I mean, he's an incredible actor, and he's a very open artist, and really interested in collaborating and finding the right tone and finding the right uh, spirit for you know for the lines. But I think it all came very natu- naturally to him. You know, I think story wise, the tension had been building over time. And I think Howard Hamlin's really in a corner here, like one that's pretty unimaginable. Like, what do you do when someone's mm-hmm. going after you in this way? How do you combat that, especially with the history with um, with Jimmy's brother? And like, it's it's I think it's pretty unprecedented, but he's frustrated and he's trying to he's trying to put an end to it um, and using like and I think he doesn't understand obviously how far Jimmy's willing to go um because that's pretty hard to understand um because I think Jimmy Jimmy doesn't even know yet you know it's a living breathing thing that is um it's very messy uh and uh Patrick wasn't afraid to get into that and I think he I think he played it so beautifully that scene is beautifully played by him and by Bob, it, it, yeah, Pat, it's great seeing more stuff with Patrick and uh, with, with Hamlin, seeing him be, a you know, revealing different layers to his character. But I love the way it's written and the way it's directed. That whole boxing scene, the way it's written and the way it's directed is really caught my attention because we have seen scenes before. I think we talked about this in the writer's room in the early days. We have seen scenes before where people box you know, two characters who are not fighters box in, in a sitcom type way. And you avoided Allison and the writing and, and Melissa, you and the directing, you avoided all the tropes and all the, uh, the, the pitfalls of, okay, now this is where, this is where the two guys fight and it's going to, you know, it's like, it's the way Bob plays it is so looking askance at it. This is so ridiculous. Uh, are you, we're seriously doing this and yet and, and and so that works that 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 take that takes the edge off it and then the way uh Howard says you know I, I don't think this is going to work I, I it probably won't work but you know I, I'm going to try I'm I'm, just, I'm at the end of my rope and I'm trying to and then the way they so all that stuff was beautifully written and then the fight they're neither they're they're neither comically bad nor unbelievably good they're just mm-hmm. this. It's really well choreographed and really well directed because they're you. You rode a walked a very tight tightrope in that. You, with a scene like that, you figure either they're going to be like you know wailing away at each other, and it's like two two middle aged dudes, and it's going to be embarrassing, and it's going to be comical, <laughs> or or it's going to be oh gee, one of these guys is suddenly turned into Muhammad Ali, and it's it was really. It was really well done. I, I uh, uh, you know, I think we had discussed in the writers' room: is this going to work? Is this, you know? But Allison and uh, Melissa made it work, as as did obviously as did uh, Bob and uh, Patrick. Can I just interrupt real quick? the The line from Howard towards the end of that scene: "You've mistaken my kindness for weakness." I love that. Stuck with me for days afterward, and yes. it's such an amazing, like, super quick way to sum up Hamlin's character. And that that fight kind of goes from fun and, you know, it's like, oh, they're finally going to duke it out a little bit. And then you it, it turns the longer yeah. the fight goes, the punches get harder. Yeah. And then Hamlin has that physical knockout, the emotional knockout with that line. And then you kind of just sit while, looking at Jimmy on the ground. You're like, Howard is the good guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you yes. just saw this whole fight go down. And Howard's always been the guy you love to hate. And now he, that he's kind of getting it from all sides, it that line in particular really made me step back and look at that character as like he's he's the good guy in this game. Very and well it's not put. something I've really thought about until that exact line, that exact moment. Yeah, I got to say that I was kind of happy to see that Howard won, even though, <laughs> you know, 
I, I, I was happy to see that Howard smacked Jimmy. I mean, I was like, <laughs> you know. And something that Al added, you know, there's at that point where, you know, uh, where Howard starts to gain the momentum, uh, Jimmy like steps on his foot. Like yeah. he's just this sort of scrappy yeah. kind of underhanded Dirty move. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, like, and that's kind of, I mean, not that I think of Jimmy always as a dirty fighter, but he'll do what he's got to do. And mm-hmm. he's doing that right in that moment. And I thought that yeah. was a real stroke of genius from Alco. That was a great touch. We talked a lot about what happens to the body during a fight, both in terms of exhaustion and adrenaline and mm-hmm. how it's all well and good if you're Jimmy, to think it's kind of fun in the beginning. But when someone actually hits you, something changes chemically in your body and you have adrenaline and you're exhausted and that, uh, you know, animal (laughs) stuff takes over. And Melissa, I I think, was just so sensitive and smart in helping the actors track what was happening physically and emotionally so that we would go on that journey with them and experience like a real, those real shifts of when it is not, it's not funny at all anymore and yeah. actually becomes dangerous. That's what's that great line always attributed to Mike Tyson. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Was that a real boxing ring? Uh, where was that? Where you guys shot that? Uh, no, uh, Denise Pizzini and Ashley Marsh and the team created that out of a what? rock space. Yeah. yeah. Wow. We looked at a bunch of real boxing rings and they, they did not suit us. Oh. Yeah. How one. Come? Yeah. One main issue is just the height of the ceiling. Oh. Like in order to shoot this properly and give ourselves any kind of uh, room with the shot composition and um, and even safety. Uh, like this giant room was almost, the ceiling wasn't almost tall enough. It's amazing like how much height you want. If you want to get up, there's a, you know, I think you see it briefly, but we're above them. And in order to get above them at all, uh, you need some real height to the room. That's interesting. You knew you wanted a shot above them, so you said, I, I, I'm, I'm going to get the shot above them, so I need to be in a place where I can get that. I got yeah. you. Well, that's, that's good planning in advance, obviously. And yeah. a lot of those gyms had actually especially low ceilings. Okay. So <laughs> that, uh, that definitely. And, and I think uh, Denise, like to her great credit, kept kind of pushing for something. Um, and always, you know, said, I can make it smaller. I can, you know, I can make sure it doesn't feel too grand or too elaborate. And, uh-huh. and I think she and their team really delivered on that. I also really admired how the actors were not trying to look cool. Like there, we, we never fell into that trap, both um, because of, of s- smart acting and directing that, oh, sh- you know, I was a little worried ahead of time. Are they going to look too experienced? You know, and Bob, because right. he did train for nobody, you know, right. he had to unlearn some of the stuff that he had worked so hard to learn. He had to put his feet in the incorrect position. He had to, you know, a lot oh. of the yeah. stuff, the muscle memory that he worked on for nobody had to be undone. And both wow. he and Patrick were so, um, you know, I, I thought I, I really just re- respected their a, a willingness and ability to to dial in how competent or not it made sense for them to be. Yeah, that foot position things are that's a great example. And Luis Moncada like had a, such an eye for that. Yes, like th- you know this is how a real boxer would stand. This is how somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, who's just ah. like in it for the first time, would stand. Mm-hmm. And really keeping an eye on that and, and keeping all of us honest about it. Ah. And how tired they would be. You know, it's that's super exhausting. So also just, you know, you, you, you know, Luis would remind them and, and eventually they also felt it. Like it, it's, it's really hard now. Really. Wow. You're tired. You're even now you're, you know, he was coaching wow. them through it. That's awesome. So I don't want to let this go by um, and we are get called out for no time because there's two really important things, I think, to talk about, especially the genesis of it. Um and sort of the long game, I can I feel like I'm I can be comfortable saying the long game, um, because you leave it it starts here, is Gus. Well, it doesn't start here. It actually starts a couple of episodes before Gus's spidey sense, fastidiousness, and also I'm just going to mention it, and then you guys can go to town. Um, the end with uh, Lalo and Margareta in Germany. 
Um, the, the notes that, that I have are like uh, laundry, Gus and Mike in the unfinished super lab, the power cable, the pacing, the gun, <laughs> and, um, and also, you know, Lalo, if you guys could expound on all of that. Well, I think uh, I think when we find Gus in his office, he's going about his business, just like trying to stay in his Gus Fring, uh, Los Pollos Hermanos um, proprietor public facing mode um, and do and do his work. But he is like there's something tugging at him. Mm-hmm. And he has this, he's wearing this bulletproof vest that Ray so beautifully established in 604. And he's got this gun around his ankle. Right. Uh, and and he hates it. He hates that he's being forced to take these measures that impede on his public facing humanity. Like, and it, it's, 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 it's actually really making him a little crazy. And like, we, mm-hmm. we never see Gus crack. We never see Gus show like anything that he doesn't want to show. But here we see that discomfort and frustration peeking through just a bit. And we get that moment of him looking in the mirror where he's, um, he's actually like full of fury. And then he tamps it back down and is like, all right, this is what I've got to do. And he heads back out to his restaurant to like put that aside, but he can't, he, d- he like, he goes through those motions, but he finds himself overtaken by the not knowing where Lalo is and not knowing what his next move is. And when he is being forced to be reactive, that is a place of total discomfort for Gus. Um, and I think that's what we see at Los Polios Hermanos and where he, you know, he can't focus on his customer. He can't be the guy he wants to be. But we see him go outside and I think a, a flip a, or a, a switch flips a little bit there. And he's and he's like, you know what? I'm no, I like come and get me. I'm not going to like cower and hide and wait in fear like I, I got to make some moves here because this is not something that's sustainable. Part of what I love about this episode and why it was so fun to write is bec- because of the different sides of these characters that we know and so well, uh, we're starting to poke through. And you're, you're right, Peter, when you say about Melissa um, having an advantage, or at least I had the advantage. Of, <laughs> I, the, I had the advantage of working with a director who is so, so deeply familiar with the characters, because then you can really carefully um, dial in exactly how much they're starting to crack. And so we talked about how, like, Howard now is going to be, box you know, that, that seemed like a kind of wackadoo when we were talking about it in the room, but then there it is and it's happening and it's very real and it's a different side of him and different dynamic between them. And then Gus's sort of moment of being truly rattled and startled, from, which is, seems very unusual. And then Lalo is going to pretend to be a businessman and try to seduce a woman. So Very are, romantic, Lalo. Right? Yes. Um, so it was very fun just to see see these these different different colors i love and speaking of that that's a yeah i love that scene in germany that uh and where, where was uh, so did you really go to germany allison and yeah we did. and what was the german crew like uh what were the accommodations like in germany how was the beer the beer was delicious <laughs> The accommodations were nice, I thought, Melissa. What did you think? A bit, a bit severe, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was, it was. We were, of course, in Albuquerque, yeah. um, and you know, Christian and Denise uh, and and Marshall and his team really had to work their magic, I think, to create another atmosphere, another world within our world. Um, but it, you know, I did have a little extra time to look around the city with Christian and try to find uh, a home for Werner that made sense and and for Margareta and uh, to create a, you know, a bar that could be hopefully, believably German. I see you have a a visual effect shot in there that wasn't quite done when I saw it. (laughs) We just had to get a tram. We got a tram. We brought it Uh, to Albuquerque. Aren't you guys... Aren't you guys blue screening though? Part of that shot though, I thought I saw some blue screen up there. No? Uh, just a li- just a little. Um, I mean, like the house next door. Or something yeah, like we that? we were just, yeah. There were a couple of things we were just we were trying to, you know, take rodeo our amazing visual effects partners guidelines. Um, we had Alejandro uh, with us, thank goodness, to help 
uh, help us with that. But we're just trying to make it, knowing what we're going to want to accomplish, try, try to make it easier on the day. Um, and we've seen that shot come along for the last few months. It's amazing. We also so had help. three languages. We had three languages running at the same time in one scene. So we had multiple translators and double, triple right. checking to make sure that everything was coming out correctly. Right. <laughs> so for folks who are not necessarily up on visual effects, when you see that wide shot where the German, the, the tram goes by, what you're looking at, you're looking at a real house in Albuquerque that is surrounded by stuff that has been added in, you know, with just like ones and zeros, basically, like computer generated, a computer generated world with with the city center way in the background and then a, and then an electric uh, uh, electric tr- uh, train going by in the foreground. I mean, you know, an electric as in a uh, commuter train going by in the foreground. And so it uh, and it's taken months to create it. Right. For those guys. And it's also it, it just it's an extraordinarily long shot. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's it's a it's a very long take. It's uh and and this I we would have not have dared do something like this until we we crossed paths with the the folks at Rodeo. Uh, I can't say enough great things about them and and their work because uh, I, I would have personally I would have not wanted to do something like this because I wouldn't have had the faith that it would look good. And these guys these these guys are just the the whole the whole crew up there in. Uh, in Canada are just doing a fantastic job and this this particular but I think what's 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 wonderful is the uh, combination of that of that location that uh, that we found in Albuquerque and and this uh, as, as Vince says the ones and zeros it's actually it's a what we call a digital matte painting back there uh, and I think the thing you know this is you know more and more common uh, in, in entertainment, but it's it's not something we do a lot of, and uh, I, I'm real proud of it. I think it works great. The, the attention to detail is unbelievable. There, are, of course, the, uh, the the pantograph from the tram uh, moves along these uh, moves along the cables that the uh, the electric cables and the electric cables move. They shift slightly, and it's just it's just beautifully done. And it's uh, really and of course the, maybe the, one of the best special effects is Tony. Because Tony does that, Tony does that wonderful uh, jump over the uh, over the, and that's really Tony, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes, uh, it Melissa? is. We had someone yeah. else ready, but not not needed. Well, yeah. also the also the shot, it, it's a it's a time lapse shot that's too. Right. Well, I mean, yeah. yeah, you know, it started out in the night. Yeah, and absolutely. I, I mean, at least the what the version that I've it's seen. it's yeah. like two. Yeah. No, it's like three shots in one. You're right. You're absolutely right. Wow. Gosh. Okay, so what was the what was the idea of the little dog instead of a big Rottweiler, <laughs> like a German dog, you know, big German watchdog? Alice, do you want to talk about Little Bear and who it is, who Little Bear is named? Yes, <laughs> Little to. Bear is named in honor of Diane Mercer's dog, whose name is Bear, um, and it was a complicated naming process because apparently, according to my research in Germany, Bear is not cute. A cute little animal, probably not named Bear. So I wanted oh. to name the dog Bear, and then <laughs> quickly, mm. <laughs> quickly learned uh, that's not that's probably not going to fly. So I went with Little Bear. Ah, that's, hard to say and, in German. But it seems like story wise, that's I love that story. But it seems like story wise, you don't want a big Rottweiler because, you know, this goes back to something you said a little while ago. Cal is uh, whose head are you in and we know Lalo is a scary, scary dude. I mean, he's fascinating. He's got charisma and he's handsome and he's always interesting to watch. But I mean, you, you really don't want to cross paths with him if you're a real person. And so who are you feeling worried for? So you're going to feel less worried. It's kind of drama 101, right? Uh, you're going to feel less worried for uh, for Margarita if uh, if she's got some slobbering, you know, Rottweiler in her house. Uh, so, cause I mean, the way I watch this thing, I'm interested to see what he's doing, you know, but, but I, I, when she comes back home, I'm thinking, oh shit, you know, no, she's, oh, no, 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 yeah, yeah. Good. Exactly. Just, yeah. I the, wrote in my notes, no, don't invite him in. Uh, <laughs> and, and let's talk in about her. Letters. Tell me, tell, tell us about the actress. She's wonderful. What, what's, what's her story? Andrea Such. She's uh, Hungarian. She, oh. Yeah. She's, uh, I mean, such an experienced actress and. Also, just like a, I, it, like she's she could so much nuance in her performance and yeah. really able to uh, make little tiny adjustments 
Um, I think you, you just like felt you, you that character, you have to kind of feel for her immediately, I think in order for that whole sequence to work. Cause I think you, even though like we, Lalo's bad news, but we kind of love him and we're, I think, we're kind of rooting for him when he's not with our main characters. Like, I, I don't know. Or I find myself doing that because he's just so winning in every way. And, uh, but I think with her, you wanted to feel like, you know, no, no, no please don't let her die. Yeah. Um, right. And I, I think Allison and I both had a lot of fun, like all of a sudden having this kind of flirty romance in the middle of the episode that we, we wanted that to feel believable. Like we wanted it to feel like, Maybe, you know, not that Lalo had changed his stripes, but maybe that he was sort of charmed by this woman and and perhaps that like he had been, you know, taken in by by like her vulnerability and like her and, and you know, cared enough to not murder her in her home. And I was very happy that he did. Yeah, but he was ready to. He had a gun out. Yeah, he was he, ready right? to do it. He was ready to do it. But he didn't want to. Or was he just going to shoot the he dog? He didn't want to. Did he, are we going to see a special director's cut later where they, it turns out they got it on? Yes. <laughs> Too hot I for would, TV. I would, yeah, I would very much like that. <laughs> it's, you know, speaking it. of a, a nice uh, flirty romance, we unfortunately are, are uh, going to have to wrap things up pretty soon. What? What was Incred- the segue? Incredible, incredible segue. <laughs> That was a, that was a, that was yeah. the worst yet. Yeah, it was not good. Um, but I before we do, I, there, there's one other thing that I, I really do want to 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 talk about, which is yet again another. We're getting another example of how much of the Jimmy's character of Saul Goodman was either directly inspired by or um, uh, came came out of Kim's mouth. And and the the you know his his tagline that's why I fight for you Albuquerque, and mm-hmm. you know this we see that she is the source of that, nice. and I, yeah. I I think that that's really interesting. How how when in the in the writing when did you guys start thinking about that? Because we've now seen many examples across you know the years. I, I think early on it was it was uh, I always thought I don't know Vince. And Allison, you tell me if you remember it this way. I always thought, for instance, when we found out that um, uh, Ice Station Zebra was Kim's favorite movie or Kim's dad's favorite movie, actually, uh, that the, that naming his his loan out Ice Station Zebra was kind of a little, uh, you know, a little shout out to somebody who was important in his life. But this season, things really changed because, you know, last season... Uh, not too long ago, Kim was really, you know, she was looking, kind of giving the side eye to the whole Saul Goodman persona. Uh, she she really wasn't, she didn't understand why he was doing this or what the point of it was. Uh, and this, something's changed because, you know, back in episode one, she brings it up and says, you know, Saul Goodman drives something flashy. Saul Goodman has an office, a, 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 a temple of justice. Cathedral of justice. Cathedral of justice. Cathedral of justice, right. cathedral yeah. of justice exactly. And uh, so I, in a weird way, Saul Goodman is becoming uh, both their crea- their creation together and, yeah. and a, a little bit. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, so it, we'll have to see where that goes. But she, she went from you know, not really being on board uh, with Saul Goodman to being kind of supportive at this point. Uh, and, and, you know, I think it's, I, it's, it shows that the, their relationship is anything but static. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things. These are two people who care deeply about each other and she wants him to succeed in whatever he does. And, and he feels the same way with her. He's nothing that brings him more joy is when, when she's happy. And, and I, I, that's, uh, so I, I think that's, 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 but you know, those little, those little micro decisions can take you to places you're not expecting. Absolutely. I remember having a very trippy moment in the room and I don't remember if it was those first couple of weeks of season six when we were together briefly in person, or if it was the end of season five where we all had this kind of like, oh my God. So wait a second. If Saul Goodman created Walter White, and Kim created Saul Goodman, then doesn't that mean Kim created Walter White? Oh, oh. my God. 
Just that. Wow. That's that's pretty powerful stuff. You want to talk about Russian dolls, nesting dolls. Seriously. There is. There's a name for that mathematically, right? The transitive of something or other. Yeah. The if a. Is it a syllogism? No, that's something else. I, I don't know. Yes. It's, but that's, I like what you're, that's interesting though. You know, it's just like uh, it. It took a village to make Walter White, and it took a village to make Saul Goodman, and it, yeah, because because yeah, we got to think Chuck Chuck's in there somewhere mm-hmm. too. Yes. Yeah. Kind of kind of fascinating. Nobody exists in a vacuum. You know. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And I I do love that scene that that between Jimmy and Kim where they end up in bed, sort of holding hands, and you know Jimmy's asking her, "Why did I like? Why did I like allow that to go on with Howard? Why did I get in that ring?" And she says, "Because you you know what's coming next." And I just it's such a sober hmm. moment between them, and it I think it they they know. I mean they are willingly setting themselves on this path and taking others down, you know, who are in their way and they're doing it like of their own volition. And I think yeah. it's just a very uh, chilling moment. And I, but I really love it because it just feels really honest. Um, like they're not caught up in it right there. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're understanding it. Yeah. Well, unfortunately we're going to have to wait for the future to find out uh, exactly what does come next. For, for Kim and Jimmy and Howard and, and uh, the whole gang. Uh, and and because this whole gang has to roll out and um, record another podcast after this. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to thank you guys for listening and thank all of you for coming out and spending uh, this beautiful Sunday afternoon uh, inside a room with microphones. And uh, I, I really, uh, this, this is fun. This is a fun conversation. I really love this episode. Uh, so thank you guys for doing such a fantastic uh, ep- job. It's 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 a, it was a delight to watch, and I I, I really loved it. It's a great episode. It's fantastic. We're beautifully written, beautifully directed, beautifully acted. Great. That's a great one. I'd I'd stop watching now. If I were <laughs> it. It's probably not going to get much better. Yeah. Than don't this. spoil. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Don't spoil the the track record. It's going to be. Yeah. It's uh yeah. So. Uh, Thank you guys. Oh, and thank you, Jen Carroll, for for um, creating these uh, opportunities out of sheer force of will. Yeah, and, Jen. Um, Allison, have you done this? Yes, you made me. Melissa, do it have you done it? Who's who's? Have I've, you... I've done it too. I feel like has, has Joey been... Reinish done it? I've done I it. would really like to hear that. Joey has done it, oh. but uh, I, you know, Allison, I'd like to hear you do it. I, I'd uh, I'd like to hear you take us out with your best uh, Better Call Saul. It's going to be my second best. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> oh. Again? I already gave my best. World's second best uh, Better Call Saul again? Yeah. Very on brand. (laughs) Okay, right now. Let's do it. Say action. And action. Better Call Saul. Yay! Yay! Well done. That was a good one.